Well, thank you all for staying to the bitter end. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so my name is Josh Werzer. I'm the president of SC Labs, and uh, we're an analytical testing laboratory. We're located in California. We have a location in Northern California in Santa Cruz, hence the name SC Labs, and uh, a location in Orange County. Um, and uh, we've been in business for about five and a half years, but I personally have been testing uh, cannabis for seven years. I um, started out as a research and development chemist, um, worked in, in small mo molecule synthesis and then silicon polymer synthesis, and uh, um, just kind of wanted to get out of it. Um, silicon polymer chemistry uses some pretty gnarly chemicals and uh, just kind of was looking to see what was out there one night and read a, a post on Craigslist for a job and uh, normal posting for a, a director in an analytical laboratory and uh, at the very end it said must be comfortable working with medical marijuana. And uh, at the time I didn't, I was not aware that there were any type of laboratories that would, would test medical marijuana or that there are marijuana laboratories and um, being a connoisseur of cannabis I, I filled out my resume and I was just going to go in and see what it was all about. It was more just kind of, you know, snoop on what they are doing. Um, <clears throat> I sent it in about 2 in the morning because I had to stay up late and make my resume and I uh, got a call at 8 o'clock the next morning coming for an interview, went in on my lunch break, they offered me the job and I didn't like my job so I figured, yeah, I'll do this for maybe a year and uh, leave it off my resume and go get a real job. And uh, seven years later, I'm still still doing it. So one of the, one of the really cool things about uh, what I do is um, that I've been able to kind of sit on the sidelines and, and see everything that's happened over the last seven years. I, I, I was there when we found the first CBD strain. As far as I know, that was confirmed CBD for the medical community in California. Um, it was a, it was a OG Kush um, blueberry cross yeah, that came out of Harborside, um, and uh, um, you know things like that along the way. I've gotten to see all the developments, and, and that's been really exciting. So um, what I'm going to do is just kind of briefly talk about what we do. I'm not going to keep you here too long. Um, what, what kind of issues I see in the testing industry um, over the years and, and going forward and, and kind of share some of the, the data we've collected. Um, one of the cool things also is that, that we have a huge sample size. We get to see pretty much everything that comes through the state um, and, and, and it's, it's kind of really fun to uh, play with the data and see trends over time and, and all that stuff. So um, I'll, I'll uh, apologize if I, I hurry you through this, but uh, I've got a, kind of a lot to cover. So um, why, why would we test cannabis? So first of all, a lot of states, um, California excluded right now, but um, in about a year we'll have mandatory testing, um, but uh, required testing, and and you know that's going to always need to be done at a third-party lab, and and uh, we sort of serve that function voluntarily for our clients now. Uh, no one is required to do any type of quality control analysis, or or there's no type of oversight as it sits in California, it, and it's, it's been that way. Um, but but we still have a fair amount of the, the the industry that at least does some of some type of testing activity. Um, not necessarily what they'll do under regulation. And then the rest of these you'll see um, are, are, are not necessarily um, tests that, that'll ever be required. Um, and, and kind of going to what Mark said and, and Dr. Jacobson said, um, you know, I, I have a, a presentation I do in front of infused products manufacturers and, you know, I talk about stratified sampling and, and getting an idea on, on, on your batch, batch runs and your RSDs and all that stuff. And, everyone just kind of glosses over and, and, and that's you know kind of a real problem we see with 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 our clients is you know someone might bring in a, an edible product that you know they do a run every day and once a month they'll bring in one of their products and test it and two months later they come back and say well why is this you know 20 percent higher than the one I made two months ago um, and, and and so I think um, what what we would like to see is, is is producers get a much better handle on their production processes and, and as people are getting more sophisticated um, we do see people that are that are you know have a good handle on their production processes, know know their their um, deviation throughout you know from from batch to batch and throughout a batch throughout a production run, um, and, and product improvement. And, and I also agree with Mark. I mean, I probably shouldn't be saying it. it's kind of a little counterproductive to to my business, but I, I see the big infused products manufacturers and, and probably a lot of the big producers um, having in-house labs, and, and I think that's absolutely essential. I, th I think um, the the, the the service that we we provide is is a more of going to be a third party kind of verification and, and we'll do quality control like for the small guys but the the bigger producers really should be doing a lot of this in house so what kind of tests are, are applicable and, and this is not even a comprehensive list is cannabinoids by far um, what we do the most of and, and when i started testing is pretty much all we did we also did microbiological but there's only one or two clients that bothered with that and uh you know Potentially for, for safety and, and, well, maybe not necessarily as much for quality, but for safety, probably the, the, the least important test in, in, until you get to the, the infused products. For infused products, obviously it's very important, but, um, you know, for 
for uh, herbal cannabis that you're going to smoke, uh, the difference between 15% THC and 20% THC is is, is going to be nominal for the end user um, as far as safety goes. Um, microbiological contamination, pretty straightforward. Same thing you do in, in, in food testing applications. The only difference is with cannabis being inhaled to the, into the lungs in a lot of forms, um, some of the some of the issues or some of the pathogens are, are slightly um, more or, or I guess less important. Um, mycotoxins, pesticide residues, residual solvents um, in in, in solvent-based uh, extracts, and and the products made from those solvent-based extracts. Uh, heavy metals, moisture, terpenes, um, plant fertility testing is, is something that we're, we're getting more and more requests for. And then genetic sex determination, genetic sequencing, all the stuff that um, MGC does such a good job of. So first one, uh, cannabis measurement. Um, cannabis produces dozens of compounds. None of this is news to you. And, and, and when we first started doing testing, it, you know, it was really kind of boring. Um, you know, when all we did was, and, and at, it, when I worked at Stipa, we, we, we only had three reference standards available, THC, CBD, and CBM. And we tested on a GC, and I sat there and looked at the exact same chromatogram all day long. And it was, it was the worst job in the world. But, um, but yeah, so uh, um, more and more we're starting to see a little more diversity with cannabinoids, but still, um, THCA is, is by far the dominant cannabinoid in, in pretty much everything we test, and pretty much the, the only cannabinoid that's there in significant quantities in most of what we test. Um, now, there's three different uh, instrumentation, instruments that, that people commonly use for cannabinoid testing, and, and they each have their pros and cons. I kind of always use the analogy of, well, there's a socket wrench, there's a crescent wrench, and there's a tire iron, and all of them can remove a bolt, um, but depending on what bolt you're trying to remove, um, there's, there's a best tool for that job, and I think everyone's kind of using liquid uh, HPLC, liquid chromatography for, for cannabinoid testing now. Um, allows you to test the acids. It gives you the sensitivity that you need that you can't get with spectroscopic methods and in the, the, the lower limits of detection, limits of quantification and, and better linearity. Um, this isn't the, the most interesting sample of cannabis you've ever seen. This is a check, stand, check standard because again, I, I want to show you some peaks. So this is, this is a run on a, a HPLC. And uh, I've not seen Mark's presentation, even though I, I do know him, um, but this is pretty much the exact same uh, curve he showed you, if, if you um, notice, it, it, we've got the same numbers. Um, and this comes from the Emerald Cup flower. So um, we test for this event, it was actually one of the first um, jobs we did when we opened our lab was test for the Emerald Cup and we've been testing for them ever since. And so it's really interesting, we've been able to see the trends over time um, with cannabinoids and once we started adding terpene testing, um, it, it's really cool to kind of just watch the trends. And, and a lot of these things are, are seasonal, um, they varied over the years. Um, and, and some of that data, if I had more time, I, I would love to share it, but it, it's really super interesting. But yeah, so this is the, the distribution of, of cannabinoid content um, for the Emerald Cup. And I'm, I'm going to get back to kind of why, why I'm, I'm comparing the Emerald Cup and, and why it's interesting data. Um, this is also from the Emerald Cup. So this is uh, total cannabinoids for concentrates. And this right here is uh, a comparison of the Emerald Cup. Emerald Cup, the same, the same uh, distribution you saw before, compared to um, uh, all of our samples from October. And you know that, so, so the October samples are about eight or 9,000 samples. Um, and I, I just kind of want to compare the Emerald Cup to our general population of samples and see if there's much variation. And, th and there isn't that much variation with total cannabinoids. And, and, and really, the, uh, the kind of historical or the October mean um, is a little bit skewed because a lot of we get a lot of kind of R and D stuff, trim stuff like that that ends up falling under flowered. So you get a little bit R, um, wider R or standard deviation, and, and you get a little bit lower mean, but essentially really similar. Um, and, and, and that's not too surprising. Um, but you know, with the Emerald Cup, with, and with the Emerald Cup is kind of the best of the best NorCal breeders that have been doing this for years, and in um, most of them grow from seed. It's, it's, it's supposed to be an all-organic cup, and, and we'll get into to that in just a sec. Um, and uh, um, it's people who you know, do a lot of breeding on their own. So it, it's a really good um, genetically diverse pool to kind of to look at. And uh, here's some, some, uh, some uh, distributions from you know, individual cannabinoids. The one on the left is, is CBD. Obviously, most of the samples had very little CBD. If you, if you kind of cut out any, any sample that has um, less than 1% CBD, then you, you get the light blue line and you move it over to about, um, what do we got down here, 11.3%. Uh, and so this is the, um, so, so Emerald Cup is, is a cup, so they have, and, and another reason why I'm, I'm, I'm showing you the Emerald Cup results is they have very good judging process. So it, it, and we go to a lot of these cups and, and, and a lot of the judging processes are, 
um, I guess less than stellar. Um, they truly anonymize their samples, and they pull really, really good people, experts in the cannabis industry to do the judging. And I, I, and I just want to illustrate a point here. So if you look at the top 20 samples out of 487 flower samples, I want to believe, or I want to say, um, there is uh, really no d difference in the top 20 samples versus the overall mean as far as cannabinoid content. So, you know, a higher cannabinoid content isn't going to get you um, in the top 20, and it shows no correlation. Actually, there's one sample in the top 20 that tested like 32 or 30.4 or something like that and kind of skewed it to the right, or maybe the, uh, the winners would actually have a lower mean than the, than the general population. And, and you know, I think that's one of the kind of things that the testing industry, the disservice the testing industry has done to, uh, I guess, the cannabis industry, is that when, when people started testing cannabis, and it started becoming common, it became this score game. Who has the highest testing strain? And, and a lot of really good strains just kind of disappeared. A lot of your perps, Bubba Kush, LA Confidential, I'm forgetting a bunch, but a lot of these really good strains that had very interesting terpene profiles, were, you know, had, had a lot of value, went away because they didn't test in the 20s or in the 30s. And, and, and so, um, you know, I think with kind of our understanding of, of, of what really is important, and in, 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 in that's the terpenes, is uh, um, we'll start to see some of these strains come back, hopefully. And so this is where, where you get your winner. So you, you, you map the winner's total terpene content versus the, the, the standard um, mean, and uh, you get a full standard deviation difference between the two. And so um, you know, that's the only real predictor of, of, of where a sample is going to rank from, from the numbers is terpene content. It's, it's not cannabinoid content at all. And this is just a, a chromatograph. So for, for terpene testing, um, we use GCFID. GC is, is, is you know, ideal for, for testing terpenes, similar to um, Mark's method. Uh, you get good sensitivity, uh, a longer linear range, um, and, and uh, um, really good separation on, we have 34 compounds in our, in our terpene test. And then getting back to the Emerald Cup winners, um, we have, I, I, I normalized all the samples based on, um, based on their uh, overall terpene content, so we're comparing apples to apples, and then I, uh, um, I, I, this is kind of a map of, of how many standard deviations they were away from the mean. So this is the top 20 samples again, and in which terpenes in those top 20 samples were prevalent. So you see, um, it seemed like the, the judges in this instance really uh, like their mercine dominant strains, um, alpha terpenine, isopugal, um, those are kind of minor cannabinoids, so it, it, it's hard to say how much they, they uh, contributed, um, but, but they definitely were there in large amounts in the winners. Um, and, and a lot of these terpenes actually track with other terpenes. So you have terpenes that kind of pair up, and if one's high, the other's high, and if one's low, the other's low. And, and if I have more time, on, I'd get into that. But um, so yeah, and then terpenoline, alpha pinene, beta pinene, we're all, we're all um, relatively abundant in, in the, the desirable strains. And also, I mean, that's another one. Um, and then here, here's uh, the myrcene in emerald cup flowers. If you, you graph it like that, you, you get something like that. But then if you normalize it for, with, with the overall terpene content, most of your terpenes start to look like this. You have, um, or at least the major ones. You have a lot of samples that have very little, um, a third to a half of them. And then you kind of have this even distribution, um, you know, in, 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 in certain terpenes, you know, myrcene goes all the way out to 75% of the overall terpene content. And you have uh, lemonine that doesn't necessarily Get, get as high, but, but very similar, very similar uh, histogram. But then the only one that's kind of interesting is, is terpenoline. And these terpenoline dominant strains, I, I cut the top off of this. So 377 strains out of the 470 had essentially no terpenoline. And then you had this handful of strains that had a whole bunch of it. And there, there's your terpenoline dominant. But it's just, it's one of the terpenes that kind of behaves like, like none of the others. And it's just kind of interesting. Um, so this is the terpene content of concentrates. And if, if, if I had shown you the, the slides where, where we saw the winners here, you would see that all the winners were in the last, last three bars um, with, with, with terpenes. So with the concentrates, um, high terpene content was even, even a greater predictor of, of where the, the, the um, sample would actually end up scoring in, in the cup. And I don't know what happened to my distribution curve there. It looks a little wonky. but um, All right, so the next test that... Um, you know, it's kind of important and in, 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 you know, is part of basically any state that's, that's requiring testing regulations is, uh, is microbiological testing. And uh, these are all three petri dishes with asper different species of aspergillus. 
and I didn't put aspergillus on this list for some reason, but uh, um, these are the kind of common tests. Um, California is going to require an APC, total yeast and mold, um, E. coli, coliforms, salmonella, shigella, um, and then listeria and pseudomonas in some places. Um, pseudomonas is required in the city of Berkeley. I don't know of too many states that are require it, and it's pretty debatable whether anyone should be requiring pseudomonas testing. I'm, I'm against it, but it's too, that's a whole different story. Listeria, for, for some food-based uh, infused products, I, I think makes sense. General cannabis, probably not. And then again, just to give you kind of an idea what, you know, what happens with samples. Again, the uh, Emerald Cup is supposed to be all outdoor, so this, this would be an, an outdoor, kind of more of a homogenous sample than our general sample size. But if you look at the general samples that come through the door, the numbers are almost identical. I didn't even make another slide to show you those because they're, they're almost identical. Um, and, and these are based on the, the AHPA guidelines. Um, so APC, 2.7% um, were over the AHPA limit for, for APC, aerobic plate count. Um, yeast and mold is always trouble um, at 100,000 um, CFUs per gram. Uh, that, that's the one we have the most failures, I guess, with. And, and uh, Pseudomonas, none of them failed under the, the, well, that was Berkeley regulations. Salmonella, we didn't detect any salmonella in the, in the Emerald Cup samples. Coliforms, 1.7% were over the limit. E. coli, 4% had E. coli. Um, so as you can see, um, other than yeast and mold, even an outdoor crop um, produced by you know all different people can can uh, um, come in come in pretty uh, pretty pretty safely under the, the limits that are kind of being established out there. And the HPA guidelines kind of being adopted everywhere. Um, pesticide residues. So pesticides are, are a really big issue for us now, um, and it was a really big issue. Um, starting with Elmer Cup testing, because this is the first year we did pesticide testing for them, and uh, it's supposed to be an all-organic cup. So, um, of course, no one used pesticides in their plants, I'm, and I'm sure that's, that's the way it was. And, and so it was, it's definitely a big controversy, but it, it really, I think, kind of sparked a conversation, and, and it was, you know, it's kind of a little scary, but fun to be a part of it. Um, and, and, and for us, um, our pesticide assay, again, we're not in a regulated market. No one's being forced to test. So our, our, our pesticide assay is actually very basic. And our RSD, or our, our limits of detection are, are relatively high. They're probably um, 10 to 100 times higher than, than the action levels in, in Oregon. So, so they're, they're very generous. And, and, and we do that, A, to keep costs down. And uh, um, again, to, to kind of incentivize people to do the testing. And, and, and it saves us you know, kind of expensive sample cleanup. And as you can see, um, it's still, we still see plenty of failures. So um, let me go just straight to this thing. I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time here. But uh, um, these are our failure rates. I took the month before the Emerald Cup and the three months following the Emerald Cup. I'm um, just kind of showing our overall failure rates for pesticides. Um, and the Emerald Cup, you know, it, it, it was much better than, than the mean. So, so most of the people were pretty honest. And then I think there was a few people that, um, you know, you, and, and I guess that's the fun thing. We use, you know, a, a confirmational mass spectrometry, LCM, SMS, um, with triple quad. So, you know, it's very hard to get a false positive. Um, obviously, if something's below our limited detection, it's going to sneak through. But, but it's very hard to get a false positive. So, so the nice thing about the pesticide test and, and uh, um, you know, a couple times the, the, the laboratory issue got brought up. And I, and I agree wholeheartedly. The, one of the big issues with, with laboratories is there has been very little oversight. And California did a really good thing with their new regulations by requiring everyone to get ISO 17025 certified. That's kind of the bare minimum a, 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 an analytical laboratory should meet. And, and hopefully that'll, that'll help things. But um, you know, cannabis laboratories are no different than environmental laboratories or, or, or any other, um, I guess, you know, analytical or, or diagnostic laboratory. Um, there's always going to be incentive to, to not fail people, and there's always going to be incentive to uh, um, cut corners. It, 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 it's tight margins. Our margins aren't necessarily the same as, as the cannabis industry. And, in, and right now in California, someone can throw a GC in the back of a van or even a, a near-infrared in the back of a van and drive around and call themselves a testing laboratory, and, and that's who we're competing with. So um, I, I, I get it. I understand. But uh, um, across the board with the pesticide test, it's nice because we, we don't get a lot of that because... Uh, you know, 99 out of 100 times, someone comes up to you and, well, why did I fail this? And, you know, I failed for microbutanol. What's up with that? And, well, did you use Eagle 20? Oh, yeah, well, that's, I can't use Eagle 20. So I, I think also, too, in, with kind of the grower community, as they get more sophisticated, uh, you'll see a lot less mistakes. But, uh, um, yeah, so October, we had 49% of our, our samples we saw failed. And, and again, pesticide testing and the, 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 the pesticides we detect in samples it, it, it varies seasonally. And so uh, October is kind of the outdoor crop coming in. It, we got some rain early in the season, right before harvest. 
um, people probably had to, uh, to resort to the microbutanol, which is a, a fungicide. And so uh, we failed 49% of the, the pesticide samples that came in the door then. And, and, and actually, you know, we don't do, every test we get through the door isn't necessarily tested for pesticides. So, um, you know, these are people that kind of, I guess, theoretically would have self-selected for, for testing, um, and, and, and still half of them, half of them failed. Um, and then it got a little bit better after the Emerald Cup. Um, after the Emerald Cup, we, we definitely lost some clients, which, which is fine. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, people knew that, you know, not to bring their stuff in. So um, if, if, they, if they had used pesticides. So, so it's actually kind of steadily declined since then, which is, which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, again, yeah, the Emerald Cup, we still, 13% of the, the samples had, had one, or another, one or two pesticides. Or three, I think a couple had three. But uh, um, yeah, so back up here, that's just a graph. And, and those are the pesticides that we test for. So we only have, I think, 12 up there. Um, and, and we selected those because those are the ones people are actually using. So, um, you know, with cannabis, your, your big pest and your big pest concern is going to be mites. There's aphids and there's thrips and there's a few other things that will attack cannabis. But, but what, what, people, what, what destroys crops and, 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 and people's biggest concern when it comes to cannabis are, are mites. So there's a handful of pesticides that are, people are using to, to kill the mites. And there's, a, you know, there's, there's one or two fungicides people use, and there's a couple plant growth regulators. So um, paclobutrazole and, and diminazide are actually plant growth regulators. And um, those, those are compounds that, that were packaged in a lot of hydroponics products, kind of sneakily, too, where 99% natural and not necessarily labeled. And, they're making buds really hard, and they keep the plants nice and short, and, and, and improve your yields 20, 30, 40 percent. And, and you know, why wouldn't I use it? And uh, um, we've seen a lot less of that now. There's, it's, it's been harder to get. A lot of the products have, have had have had diminished and paclobutrazole all pulled because they're not meant for any type of um, crop that's used for human consumption. And uh, and people have kind of gotten gotten hip to it. And by and large, your your your, your cannabis producers aren't aren't trying to to do it wrong. A lot of them a lot of them have the best intentions and. Just, just didn't know any better. So um, we see less and less paclobutrazole and diminazide. But that's, that's our pesticide assay, and we're still, still failing 50% of the people. And, and again, um, you know, that's not necessarily the case across the board. There's, a, there's um, you know, a lot of labs that test for 60, 100. They, they do a whole, whole panel for organochlorines. It's an ELISA kit, and everyone passes. So um, we have 12, and we fail 50%. And we have really bad limits of detection. But again, that, that was, those will decrease by about a thousand times when, when regulations come in. So those numbers will go up a little bit. Um, and then I just want to briefly touch on residual solvents because I think I'm out of time. Um, and so, yeah, so residual solvents with, with solvent extracts coming on, on the scene and, and the kind of the extraction histogram I showed you for the Emerald Cup, um, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of samples that came in 40, 50, 60 percent um, uh, cannabinoids. And that's because it, it's an organic cup. It, all the concentrates were supposed to be solventless. And uh, um, we see less and less of those. If you show the general population histogram for um, what we see for concentrates, 95 to 96 percent of the concentrates we see now are all either solvent extracts or CO2 extracts. And there's, there's very little water hash. There's very little keef out there these days. Um, and, and it's just kind of what the market is, is determined. Whereas you know, five, six years ago, um, it was probably flip-flopped. You'd see maybe. 80 or 90 percent keef in, in, in water hash, and once in a while you get a really cool solvent extract, and, and it'd be unique, but, but with kind of dabbing coming on and all that stuff, um, we see very little of the, of the old type extract. So residual solvent analysis, pretty simple. Um, instead of dissolving your sample in a liquid and having all your gases that you're trying to measure bubble up, um, you, you put it in a, a much bigger vial in a solid form. It goes into an oven, gets shaken a little bit, gases get liberated, you've got a partition coefficient, you sample from it, you, and uh, um, you measure the gas. It's pretty straightforward. Um, most of your solvent extracts that use solvent are, are made with butane or propane or a combination of butane and propane. Um, there's some people still out there making extracts with kind of the heavier hydrocarbons or, or maybe alcohol, but it is definitely very few. Um, so, um, mycotoxins, that's another test that, that's coming up, and, and it was kind of brought up. Um, in, in Kevin's, Kevin's talk, and a uh, very tough one also. Um, with pesticides, it's hard enough to get through the matrix effects, but when you're, when you're looking kind of a couple orders of magnitude more sensitive for mycotoxins, um, it's, it's definitely a challenge, and, and it requires pretty, pretty um, expensive mass specs that can, that can go really low, and, and a lot of sample cleanup. Um, that's what that talks about. So yeah, I'm, my time is out. Um, sorry, I kind of hurried through that. But uh, yeah, that's the testing industry. So it, it's, it's definitely been an evolution, and the testing industry it has gotten better. And, and we've seen, seen kind of the industry as a whole get more sophisticated and growing up. And, and so uh, 
um, you know, it, it's, it's been an interesting, interesting trip the last seven years, kind of just seeing the evolution of, of, of the whole cannabis industry. And, 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 and yeah, thanks to Medicinal Genomics um, for, for putting this on. And, and, and that's kind of one of the cool things of, of seeing the evolution of the industry five, six years ago. Um, you know, the conference at Harvard, Harvard Medical School with, with kind of the, uh, the level of, of presenters that we had today um, would, wouldn't, wouldn't even been on my, on my radar. So um, it's been exciting, and, and I can't wait to be back in seven years and, and see where it goes then. So thank you.